of the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita is taught by Paramahansa Yogananda. So for this week, the theme is, did God create the universe or become it? Swamiji writes, truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, contains a passage that explains the essential truth that creation is a process of becoming. The universe is not separate from God the Creator, but a part of Him, even as our own dream creations during sleep are figments of our consciousness. God's is, in the, God's is the life. God's the reality. Not a melody could be composed, not a poem written, were the melody and poem not already there, simply waiting to be expressed. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Ego-directed desire is like static. It distorts the radioed messages of infinity. But the pristine impulse from the divine undistorted by limitation and delusion, is the life that gives rise to all that is. As the seventh chapter of the Bhagavad Gita states, I am the fluidity of water, I am the silver light of the moon, and the golden light of the sun. I am the Om chanted in all the Vedas, the cosmic sound moving as if soundlessly through the ether. I am the manliness of men, I am the good, sweet smell of the moist earth. I am the luminescence of fire, the sustaining life of all living creatures. I am self-offering in those who would expand their little lives into cosmic life. O oh Arjuna, know me as the eternal seed of all creation, of all creatures. In the perceptive, I am their perception. In the great, I am their greatness. In the glorious, it is I who am their glory. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. of the one light that we read more or less every week and often ironically the first week of the year which is the first reading often gets lost because of Yoganandaji's birthday and so it's usually the first Sunday I guess in fact always the first Sunday or anyway we could probably work out the math but I think I'm fairly safe in saying the first Sunday of the year is Yoganandaji's birthday around and so we often focus on that instead of on that first reading. And so this whole cycle of readings really guides us through different aspects of the spiritual path and of spiritual truths, of course, as expressed in the Bible and the Gita, but universal truths nevertheless. And so Swamiji really takes us on a journey. It's not just that he sort of thought, well, let's see, first week of January, uh, 
maybe you know the light shineth in darkness let's use that one it's very planned in a way inspired but still there's a, a flow and an order to it and so sometimes the one of the acharyas in one of the temples in America would joke that well now we're sort of in the cosmic becoming section of the year where there's a lot of in a certain way abstraction and it's less necessary on one level to go into deeply in India where it's more or less understood that yes God became everything even just to say God became everything or God manifested everything if you haven't thought that before or heard that before it takes a lot of explaining to do and yet on a personal level how much do we really believe that how much do we really understand that or put it a different way when we truly know that God became everything including us then we will be gone when you can say I know that God became me then that I the ego goes as master said when that I shall die then will I know who am I and so when we you know lest we say yes 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 I know duality Dwaita and, and Advaita and God is everything fine but those are words when we truly realize it that's self-realization in fact the question came up once to Swamiji should we use the term self-realization to describe the spiritual path or God realization this was in the context that Master used the term self-realization much more than he used the term God realization though he did use it a little bit but self-realization was very much his emphasis in terms of what he said and so on that sort of principle alone the fact that Master used it much more and used it in the name of his own organization self-realization fellowship in America in a certain way that's the end of the discussion but Swamiji was never one to say master said it therefore we do it he would hope that people students disciples would feel that in their hearts that that is the duty of a disciple when when what the master says conflicts with my own understanding or my own opinion let me sort of intelligently try to understand and reconcile that difference as opposed to saying well in this I have to say at least I am right after all I do know a few things about computers and you know it's very common that we can pull away it's natural the ego will say I would like I would like a turn and so in this way though Swamiji would never uh, lord that over anyone even with himself he would not say having lived with Master for three and a half years and having been on the path 50 years more than you don't you think I know? He would never do that. He would say I would always allow sweet reason to convince them or nothing. Because why? Partly because we need to develop that own strength in ourselves. Also I don't think he wanted to model the thing of clobbering someone on the head with your authority. In fact, we would sometimes joke at Ananda that um, people would try to pull a Swami card. You know, when you have a card game, there's, I forget what game it is, but you trump other cards with uh, your card. And if you have the biggest card, then you win everything. And so that's where the origin of this phrase, people would pull out the Swami card. So if someone would say, let's have this flowers on the altar. And they would say, no, we're going to have this. Oh, but I don't think so. Well, but Swamiji likes these okay and everybody would scamper and then so but you rarely ever got to pull a Swami card and Swami was very careful about passing out those cards and saying I want it this way because he'd say I don't want anything other than your own happiness other than our own collective joy and so we would joke that even Swami wouldn't use a Swami card and so it's important to remember that too in, ta in our talkings with others and dealing with others not to try to just sort of on the basis of just raw authority or don't you think that I know what I'm talking about or all that because it really pulls the rug out of uh, fr out the, from under the feet of the other person and you know what I mean if it's ever been done to you so 
going back now, this debate about, or question about God-realization versus self-realization. Swamiji didn't say, Master said it, therefore. Though he could have. But what he said was, even the term God-realization separates it from ourselves by a degree. All we're trying to do is realize our own self. Now, yes, that self is the big self. And it is God, certainly. It's not that it's a debate between the concept of self versus God, but even to say God in this sense separates it from the truth, which is that it's really our own self. As we read in the Gita, or heard in the Gita, all the beauty of any manifestation, it's God at the center of that. I am the fluidity of waters. In the glorious, I am their glory. All those best things that we love, it's God at the center of it, and in ourselves too. But really, again, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, what we're trying to embrace is not something else. And again, intellectually, yes, 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 sure. But in terms of really feeling, when I merge with God, I will become fully who I am. I won't become anything else. And all that I may be resisting or not sure about if I really want to go over there, there's no there. It's not over there that I'm going. It's just deeper and deeper in here. And what is pulling me away or distracting me or making me kind of hesitate, that's the foreign matter. That's what's not me. As we often say in these level one classes or when people are learning to meditate, as Master said, the soul loves to meditate. So if in your head someone is talking into the microphone saying, I don't feel like meditating today, it's not the soul who's saying that. You see? It's a yes, but I know, but I'm saying it again when this I shall die. Now, this is a real battle. I don't mean to say that intellectually we say, oh, yes, 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 fine, okay, now, thank you for clearing that up. But still, at the same time, it's something to keep in mind constantly that God is calling us home, but he's really calling us to, to grow up, really. And if sometimes we see little children who say, I don't want to grow up because I see the grown-ups, they all have to work. So I don't want that. I would rather just be fed and driven around this place and that place and basically entertained. And we can understand, but in fact, when we become saints, that is what happens to us. We sail along through galaxies. Master said that advanced yogis can create entire galaxies and, you know, it's, or destroy them. So you better be careful about crossing any of these great yogis. No, they only work in harmony with God's will, so they, they would only do so if he asked them to. As even Master said directly to Swamiji, when Swamiji said, Master had asked him, will you give me your unconditional obedience? And we have to really think about what that means. I mean, unconditional obedience, you, if you really give that, that means anything the person says, you have to do. And how can you give that unless you know in advance everything they're going to ask and check it carefully and then sign off? Then I can give it. Otherwise, what if you ask, as Swamiji said, what if sometimes I think you're wrong? And which was a very sensitive question because you could say, well, a real devotee would just say, yes. And it's possible that a deep devotee could say yes and mean it. But often people can say yes without thinking through the implications and then when something comes up contrary suddenly they say, well actually now I wonder. After their pledge has been given, Swamiji saw the implications at the beginning. He said, what if I think you're wrong? What am I supposed to do? Supposing that comes up and Master said, I will never ask anything of you that Divine Mother or God doesn't tell me to ask. And Swamiji knew Master was telling the truth. And he said, in that case, I give my unconditional obedience. And he did. And so it didn't mean he never disagreed, but he always cooperated. And then later found the basis of his disagreement had no base at all. And he said, if ever I found that Master was somehow less than my ideal of perfection, I later realized 
that it was because my own ideal was below that perfection, that I was limited in my concept of perfection. For Master's first talk that Swamiji heard on a Sunday was full of so much humor and laughter that Swamiji was a little shocked at first, just that all these sort of jokes, <laughs> and he was used to sort of that truth should be stated ponderously, as you sometimes hear in discourses on Vedanta. You know, you've probably heard this style of speaking where every word is about one word a minute. <laughs> and every Sanskrit word, especially if it has like a DH in it, is Dharma. <laughs> And again, listen, it's a valid way. But if you're not sort of caught up in that mood, it, it, well, anyway, never mind, it speaks for itself. Master was not that way. He was very natural. Why? Because many reasons, but also because when we laugh, it opens our hearts. And half the time, we're sort of clawing our way through the week to get to the Sunday, myself included. Then the joy comes in. Oh, finally the heart can open up again. And so... We, we need that humor. God has a sense of humor, don't you think? My gosh. Master described this world as, God, as a, God's hospital and zoo. <laughs> Which we laugh at, but then sometimes we don't notice that, you know, we're actually on display also, you know, just with a little name tag and doing our little thing that we think is so normal, but is amusing others. As one English author wrote, what do we live but to make sport for our neighbors? You know, they just get... Yeah, speaking of which, we were at the uh, Vandalore Zoo the other day. And this, you've, you've seen this, it's actually a, a sign in many zoos. We saw it in Delhi too. It says, don't tease the animals. And it has the picture of the human in the cage. Like, and it says Homo sapiens underneath. And it's got the elephant that's squeezing his nose. And the lion has the, his jaws clamped around the leg. And the monkey's going to like pull his ear and all these things. And just like, yeah, that's what it would be like if the tables were turned on us. You can just imagine. So we better be nice to them. So, so keep that in mind, that even as much as we love God and seek God and, and express devotion in an I and thou relationship, which is meaningful, and I'll get to that. Nevertheless, even to make the subtle distinction between God-realization and self-realization, Swamiji said, this is why it should be self-realization. And remember, all the things that you think are so beautiful in God are also in you. And let me get into that in a, in a moment with an example. But having said that, Master said the saints, even after merging into God, often incarnate on earth just to enjoy an I and thou relationship, a separate relationship, and a, a relationship of me being able to express love to you and you being able to express love to me. Because it's so sweet. So again, this isn't uh, uh, trying to say that the impersonal approach is better than the personal approach. That's the, the beautiful thing about it. It's always both and. What you can get out of, uh, what you can get out of both facets of the truth. Again, something much more understood even culturally in India. India is very much a both and culture, whereas the West is more of an either-or culture. Now, of course, people in India can use either-or logic and, in fact, can even be Westerners who are kind of wondering what they're doing here. A friend of mine was born uh, in the Punjab and he was saying to his mother, I, I, what is all this? I want toast and jam for, for his food. And he was saying, why is, why is everything... So, there are, people should follow the rules here and clean up a bit he was saying outside his window she said son you were born in the wrong country 
Now, of course, he has great love for India and is very much uh, a devotee of God and, a, a, you would say, a son of India. And yet, he had those sort of lingering, what we might guess, European samskars. In fact, it was interesting. Anytime he wanted to go to a European country, he could get a visa within 24 hours with no restrictions or anything. Just like, my gosh, can you spread some of that around to others? Because we've been wanting to have friends visit other places. Anyway, so just to say, similarly, we have Indians walking around America sometimes, also going, what am I doing here? Well, let me meditate. And this is actually a true thing. Master said that Indians are being born in America and Americans are being born in India. And of course, the soul has no country. The soul really has no planet. But I'll leave that thought there. And so we've just as much been in every country. So in a way, it's kind of funny to see people having such strong pride about anything. Nationalistic pride or uh, culture pride or even gender pride. It's like, look, you've been everything, each and the other. And so it's more that tendency of pride that you'll see going through. For example, a very proud follower of one religion and the other is false, and then you get to be reborn in the other one and say that the first one was false. We want to break and open up these identifications. But the logic of the West, very much that it developed, came from Aristotle that said that something is either this or that, and it can't be both. And this is actually very helpful in developing mathematics and uh, computer science and science and all these things because it really helps us to uh, analyze and really though, what does analysis do? It even, what does it even mean? Lysis, it means to cut, to separate, which can be very good when you're trying to separate out the error to get to the truth. But on the other hand, it's very helpful to have a uniting viewpoint, something that unites everything. And that's very much a Asian Western, uh, not Asian Western, an Asian Oriental Indian view too. Both and. And we need both. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, it sounds like the both and wins. We need powers of analysis. We need powers of unity, which means we ultimately need both. And so the thing is that this there's the advantage of the personal viewpoint, there's the advantage of the impersonal. But when Arjuna asks Krishna, which one is better? He says, both are fine, but do the personal one. Why? Because it's easier. It's much easier to have an I and thou relationship. We have I and thou relationships all around us with parents, with children, with friends, with the beloved. And so it's, we're practiced, you could say, in that. And as that affirmation of love was saying, let me draw through all these channels thy infinite love. And so for many of us, when we feel attuned to Yoganandaji, we also see the divine expressed in him. And so we have that I and thou relationship between disciple and guru. But again, also between chela, between child, the guru, you are the guru's child. And so, one thing though, even then, to remember in that, is that it's still God coming through you. Master never said, these are all my disciples. A woman asked him once, just conversationally or at a meal, that, uh, oh, Dr. Lewis was your first disciple in America, wasn't he? And she asked it very you know, innocently. And Master, who had been very friendly and up to that point, said, that's what they say. And she was shocked that just that suddenly this change in his demeanor. And then he said more gently, I call no one my disciple. They're God's disciples. And it wasn't that he needed to be humble or get himself out of the way for his own spiritual preservation. There was nothing, no danger of that for him. But he was emphasizing God is the guru. God is the one bringing the healing. And he would say very often, I killed Yogananda long ago. No one dwells in this temple now but God. And he would also say, I am no one. Swamiji said something similar. People were saying, Swamiji, you, one per woman asked a question near the end of his life. You've told us not to get attached, but is it okay to get attached to you? And he said, well, 
you know, you're not really attached to me. And if you are, what you're attached to is my detachment. Because of, of course, when we're detached, then so much love and joy can come through us and not be particularized. But then everybody feels it. But then she persisted. Yes, but you said we, so we can be attached to you? And so she forced him into a bit of a philosophical corner. And he said, you know, what you really like is not me, but what you see in me. And he said, and what you see in me is really just your own self reflected back to you. So keep that in mind too with the guru, with the saint, with anyone that you draw inspiration from, especially when it feels so sweet and even personal and intimate. It's because it is personal and intimate. It's because it's your own self that you're seeing. That's why it feels so familiar. That's why it feels so welcoming. And yet, it's your own self. It's almost that we need these little catalysts. The guru, in a way, you can say, is a catalyst that speeds up this reaction or helps us through this drama that we're really just playing out with ourselves. We need that. Swamiji said once that the role of the avatar is really to bring God to earth in a particular way with a particular emphasis. Or you can think of it as the veil of Maya is there and he sort of rubs away and cuts away at the veil until there's a thin opening that God's light comes through. And then basically his job is done. And he says, here's the exit. Banga. But then basically he's just like a conductor, just getting us off. And we just have to follow that light. He's already done the work. And so, of opening the curtain. And so, remember that too then, when we encounter, as it said in the first reading, the, dark, the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. We can't expect everyone to understand what it is that we're doing in anything, but especially on the spiritual path. And if they don't understand it or they don't relate to it, it's not a rejection of us personally. And it's not even necessarily uh, that they're right, although often, uh, well, at least in my experience, people will be very sure to say that they are right and that we're wrong. But the point is really that they are still awakening to the truth of their own soul. And so, just like what about those pockets of our own consciousness that resist? So we can see that in ourselves. Okay, let this be a reminder to hold nothing back. And to when I get, ooh, maybe this part we're not going to talk about. Doesn't mean we talk about it outwardly, but inwardly. Let me lay open this then be frank about things that I'm holding back on, to be more offering, or to understand what the fear is that makes me hold back. And that's the last point I wanted to make, is that when we see somebody who is against spirituality, or critical of us, or all these things, think about it. As Master said, if someone is truly intellectual, he said, the real intellectuals, you never have a problem with them. Because a true intellectual, so to speak, meaning following the path of intellect, intelligence, reason, is wanting to know the truth. I mean, intelligence is a way of discovering the truth. It's the truth that matters, not the intelligence. And so he said, if you're truly wanting the truth, a true intellectual, you never have a philosophical problem with them. But it's the others, he said, who have already made up their minds about what the truth is then you have to go through all this. He said, then with them it's better to keep silent. But the point is that when we see somebody who is, I mean, if you're against something, why be against it? Why not be for someone? If someone gives you, hey, there's this new sweet, I don't want it. Have you ever had it? No, but I know I don't like it. I mean, is that even a fair-minded? Here's someone I want you to meet. I don't want to meet them. Have you met them before? No, but I know I won't like them. We sometimes see people with that attitude. Sometimes we find it in ourselves, a little shy. <laughs> and it's because only of one thing. It's because of hurt. 
I've been hurt before in a situation. This reminds me of that situation, so I don't want it again. So you may see someone, very much the people shouting the most against these uh, spiritual teachings are people who have been hurt by them in the past, maybe past lifetime. And out of that sense of betrayal, and which probably came from misunderstanding and so on, again, I'm not saying it with judgment at all, we have these elements in ourselves too. But to just say, well, if you're against something from the beginning, it's probably because you've been hurt by it. And so in situations like that, it's good to pray for the person, rather direct, whether directly or just indirectly. Know that God is calling them back, just as uh, I was going to say, just as Divine Mother said, just as Darmini said, all your children, Mother, call you. Knowing not, it's you they call. Some through mists of their unknowing, bruised and hurting when they fall, turn away, but who can leave you? You the mother of us all. If a child forgets its mother, will she coldly turn away? Wise or foolish, we are your children. Guide us, mother, if we stray. And then it continues. So Divine Mother says, yeah, that's fine. You can run in all the circles you want. You can't go anywhere. And she's taking care of them and bringing them all back. I'd like to end with this reading from Whispers from Eternity. After the prison petals of this earth life fade away. Sorry, this is entitled After This. After the prison petals of this earth life fade away and my soul perfume disappears with the mighty cosmic wind of spirit, no more would I be confined in the flower cage of life. If I must return, however, let it be to mingle the dewdrop tears of other prisoned souls with my own, that I may show them the way by which I myself won my freedom. Oh, I would not mind dwelling for a time in the roses and the daffodils, if it were by my own free will. But forever, to stay even behind the bars of beauty, Reveling in the sun rays, violet and gold, I care not. No more will I be compelled to live in even the most beautiful golden heaven. To me, it would be only a cage. Freely from flower to flower will I fly. I will wear the dark veil of the night. I will shimmer with the myriad stars. I will be their very light. I will be the waking of the dawn and I will shine in the warming rays of friendship. I will be the shepherd of stray souls, and also the humblest lamb in his fold, in all his fold. I will be the most famous among men, and the very least known in the cosmic cycle. I will be the tiniest cosmic spark, and will also roll with the mighty vapors of life, dashing myself exuberantly upon rocks of worldly strife. I will be the clouds wearing rainbow garlands. I will puff out bubbles of planets with my breath, then float them on the tides of space. I will be the babbling brook and the voice of the nightingale. As emotion waves, I will surge on the sea of all beings, holding to a little flotsam of laughter. I will float to the endless shore of supreme bliss. I will sing through the voices of all. I will preach in all temples and through all prayers. I will think with the thoughts of all. I will love everything and everyone with the love of God. The hearts of all will be my heart. The souls of all will be my soul. And the smiles of all, my smile.